John. Ma'am. What was the most – actually, no, I'm not even going to argue that. I'm going to start with the most exciting bit of the budget for me. Yesterday, I thought it was the British ISA or what I'm going to call the BISA um, – because I've been looking for that for so long, waiting for it, very keen on it. It wasn't exactly how I wanted it. It was still exciting. We'll come back to that. Most exciting bit was the bung to the um, Space Centre in Shetland. Yes. You know, we've talked about space a lot on this podcast. And the idea that the government are behind the idea of Shetland being a centre for satellite launches, I thought was really something. It's a bit niche, but kind of exciting. I was very surprised that you didn't tweet on it as soon as it came out, but then I realised you'd obviously missed it amid the flood of other exciting things that came out in that uh, that section of the budget. No, <laughs> I didn't miss it. I was just so excited by Brit Isis or Bices or Bices or uh, Bryces. I don't know. We'll we'll figure out where we're going with this one. Um, that I kept all my excitement about the Space Centre to myself. But then, of course, the day after the budget, I suddenly realised how exciting it was and also realised that I'm probably, and someone let me know if I'm wrong, I'm probably one of the very few, maybe the only UK journalist who has visited, visited the Saxford Space Centre on the island of Unst. Or is it Yell? Unst, Yell, Yell, Unst. A lot of islands to go through on the way. You Only know. you fix this one in post-production. Anyway, thoroughly recommend a visit. <laughs> yeah, I, I can... <laughs> I'll look it up. I, the thing is with Shetland is, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's a lovely place, but I can imagine that most journalists would have more luck getting a trip to, uh, you know, kind of Australia than kind of getting the expenses to go up to Shetland. And uh, the days off, <laughs> the, the kind of 10-hour journey. But, uh, yeah, the flight cancellations and flights to Shetland are super expensive, way more expensive than going to Australia, to be honest. Right. Moving on from that, because you know, most people aren't interested in space stations in Shetland. What they are interested is, John, and what you thought was the most interesting part of the budget. Do you know what? If this had been the first budget of a five-year term, or, a, you know, the second budget, I would actually be quite excited now. Because the Chancellor basically turned around and put the idea of getting rid of national insurance and merging it with income tax actually very firmly on the table. Um, you know, he not only cut it by another two percentage points, but he also said in the long run it'd be nice to get rid of this. Problem is, of course, he doesn't have the long run. He's probably got about kind of six months. Um, and then that is not going to be kind of maintained by the next government I wouldn't have thought unless there's a very big surprise um, so I, I think to be honest from my point of view that was the most disappointing element in that this would have been a good budget to do about three years ago and the thing is it also feeds into a problem with the British ISA because they're having to consult on it the consultation doesn't end until June half of the people who are going to be you know talking are going to be asked about them in this consultation so you know the investment platforms etc are certainly from the uh, response on twitter seem to be kind of thinking well chances are this isn't going to happen before the next election and so it's never going to happen so i think that's probably the the big disappointment this would actually be a pretty good budget if they had any room left to run but they don't yeah i agree with you i mean you know i've been uh... You and I have been calling for the merger of national insurance and income tax for a long, long time. Um, but this is a really interesting way to do it, it to gradually cut national insurance down to zero. You're not abolishing it. You're just making it kind of disappear. And income tax goes up at the same time to compensate. And what would have been absolutely amazing, you know, I know I bang, bang on about this a lot, but here you have Rishi Sunak and Hunt. They haven't got much time left. Um, and with that in mind, they haven't got much time left. We know they've got nothing to lose. They're very probably going to lose. It'd be a miracle to win, right? So they have this one-off chance, one-off chance to do a couple of things that would really move the dial for the UK, really change things. And one of those things would have been actually to go all the way with national insurance yesterday. You could have got that through before April if you'd really pushed it. It would have been done and dusted. And what a gift to the nation it would have been. Yeah. and. Uh... If they felt like really going for it, they could offset it by imposing capital gains tax on residential property and getting rid of the stamp duty at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm we've been calling saying, for that, I'm you and I, saying. again, for a couple of decades, haven't we? Never happened. But again, incredibly politically unpopular, but would mm. be really great. 
uh, for the economy, yeah, and so, for the housing market, for everything, but impossible to do unless, like these two, you've got nothing left to lose. Yeah, I mean, so I think this is the one. Well, again, it's the other slightly disappointing thing. It's like this is your one chance to grasp a political nettle uh, that no one else is going to be willing to go in there. Um, and you let it go, <laughs> presumably because you don't want the backbench rebellions and things like that that would come about. Yeah. And uh, let's go back to the British ISA briefly, because one of the things I found interesting about that is that you and I agree it's a good idea. Lots of people agree it's a good idea. It didn't come out in quite the form we would have expected. Obviously, it's only a consult consultation, but it doesn't, if it comes into play as it, as it is at the moment, it doesn't take up part of the existing allowance. It's a new allowance on top of, which means that as most people don't use their full allowance anyway, I think it's between 10 and 15% of people use their full allowance depending on the year. In a way, it's more symbolic than anything else. In that, uh, you know, anyone who's going to invest in UK equities can easily do so within the within the twenty thousand. So there aren't that many people who are going to use that five thousand. So we're not expecting, you know, tens of billions of pounds to suddenly flow into the UK market. And then we got lots of people going straight down into the weeds of what is a UK company? Why would a company with foreign operations count? How are we going to divide this up? Does an investment trust that invests abroad count? Does this count? Does that count? All, I think, completely missing the point, Yeah, which is not about specific companies and where their operations are. It's about the popularity, liquidity, and valuations inside the UK market. So to me, even the symbolism of it is enough, a symbolism of showing that the government is aware of this problem and prepared to put in place incentives to move into the UK market. And it's about the efficiency and efficacy of the UK market as a whole, not about wibbling away about whether uh, you know a, a one company counts as a UK company or another company doesn't count as a UK company. It's about our capital markets. Am I missing something? No, I mean, that's exactly right. And the thing is, a lot of people wibbling about that are the same people who are wibbling about ARM not listing in the UK. And kind of like, well, Arm's a UK company, but it's not listed here. And we were all moaning about that when it happened. You know, this is about addressing that. It's not actually about kind of boosting British business, as in businesses that are in Britain. Um, and also, the, but the other thing I thought was important is that idea of getting DC pension schemes to explicitly say where or the auto enrollment schemes basically say explicitly how much of their portfolio is in UK equities. So it's that whole nudge towards a market that is clearly being neglected for reasons that are not related to the actual companies that are listed on it. And actually, what I think is really interesting is that today's guest kind of delves into something very, very similar because you're talking about the investment trust market. And a lot of the issues surrounding investment trusts and their current discounts are purely to do with market structure and nothing to do with the underlying companies. And the UK market as a whole has basically got the same problem. So addressing that is is worth doing. And yeah, there's, I mean, they should have got rid of stamp duty on shares. That that would have been good, but that would have cost money. Um, so at least this is a start. Yeah, there is a hint, and actually I've written about this week, there is a hint in here of the return of financial repression, though, isn't there? A hint of the direction of capital and directions that the the state wants it to go in. And I was looking back to the end, you know, one of the last gasps of financial repression last time around. Uh, financial repression, by the way, being just a... a I see complicated. Look it up. Look it up. We haven't got time to run through financial oppression here. Lots of different ways to help governments run down their debt um, without explicitly uh, taking extra money from people to do so. But looking at the last gasp of financial oppression in the 1970s, in uh, late 1979, when capital controls were removed, and at that point, well, the point at which we weren't allowed to send money abroad or invest abroad, at that point, UK pension funds have pretty much all their money in UK equities, right? The day that capital controls were removed, the FT index fell by about 3%. And it did so because everyone immediately believed that people would stop sending their money abroad, investing in foreign markets. And you know what they expected? Absolute tip top max. They expected that uh, UK pension funds would allocate about 10% of their equity allocations abroad. In fact, it ended up being closer to 100%. That's fascinating. So this is a little pullback, isn't it? It's a little pullback saying, you know, come on a take here. Let's go back a little. Let's go back a little. So we're, we, I can, I sense the beginning of a pullback uh, towards the repression of the post-war period. 
Well, on that point, what I thought was interesting is that as part of the consultation, uh, they sort of nodded to the idea, or oh, should gilts be allowed to be held as part of your, you know, five grand UK only allowance? And I thought that's quite interesting, um, you know, this nudge towards getting retail investors buying more government IOUs, basically, um, and having a specific allowance that allows them to do so. So effectively, you're kind of saying it's a cashizer, but a cashizer that can hold gilts or, you know, UK listed equities. And do you know what I think, John? I think it, it's quite likely that over time it wouldn't be, you can hold gilts if you want. It'll be, oh, do you know what? You have to hold gilts. You have to hold gilts. And that's classic financial repression, directing people's capital such that they are forced, obliged to help finance the government, whether they want to or not. And that's the hint that I think we saw in this budget. And that's one of the reasons that I found this so interesting. Welcome to Merrin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Merrin Somerset Webb. This week, it's all about investment trusts. For those who might not know, an investment trust is at its simplest, just a company, the business of which is to buy other companies. So it's a quoted company, it's listed on the stock exchange. And in the main, you will only find the structure in the UK. So to walk us through everything there is to know about investment trusts and to tell us why we should be buying them right now, I spoke with Nick Greenwood. He co-manages the MyGo Opportunities Trust at Asset Value Partners. And before that, he was at Premier Might and Investors. Nick, hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Ah, It's a pleasure. Listen, I want to start, Nick, by talking about the structure of investment trust. You and I are both great fans of investment trusts and both think of them as being one of the, the greatest of investment vehicles for the retail investor in particular. And I wondered if we could just start with you explaining what exactly it is we're talking about. What is an investment trust as opposed to any other kind of collective investment vehicle? And what makes it, to your mind, superior in some ways to other types of investment vehicle? Yeah, investment trusts are a peculiarly British thing. They don't really exist elsewhere in the world. There are pockets in various places, but the most collectives are open-ended funds. So you put your money in, you take money out on a daily basis. And if you redeem, you want your money back, the fund manager has to sell stuff from the portfolio to hand it back to you, which means that you have to run, only really works if you have quite a liquid portfolio. Where an investment trust is structured a bit like any industrial company, a fixed number of shares in the market, and you want to buy or sell, you've got to go to the stock market, to, to get an order, just as if you were buying or selling Marks and Spencer. And it's a bit fiddly, but what that means is the fund manager doesn't have to buy or sell from the underlying portfolio, which means they can put a lot more conviction into the portfolio and really focus on their strongest views and not worry too much about having an investment that they couldn't sell instantly. I run both, and the differences are really that in some of the, some really interesting stocks that aren't particularly liquid, I might have 4% of the portfolio in it, in the open-ended fund, where I've always got to know where a few million is going to come from by 12 o'clock the following day, that might only be a 2% position because the liquidity isn't there to be certain that you can sell if, you, if there's a run in your fund. And therefore, what you find is investment trusts with the same managers tend to outperform their equivalent hoik. Okay, so what you effectively have, in most cases, not all, of course, because there's uh, we'll come later maybe to buybacks and discounts and redemptions and windings up, etc. But in essence, what you've got is a, a permanent portfolio. Yeah, permanent capital is, is one way of describing it. Which is very different to having a portfolio that constantly fluctuates in, in, in size. And that's the key difference. Yeah, and you don't have to obsess about liquidity, which is important. It gives you more stocks and more companies and more investments to choose from than rivals who are running open-ended funds. And the other differences are that an investment trust will have or should have a fairly engaged board of directors whose job it is to look out for the shareholder. And that's something that's quite important. And of course, an investment trust can borrow money to try and improve returns overall. And that's something that most open-ended funds can't do. Indeed. All right. And the other thing that's very important when you're talking about investment trusts is the idea of discounts and premiums. So because an investment trust is effectively a listed company, the business of which is to invest in other assets, be they shares in other companies or be they uh, a, a stake in a renewable energy project or something like that. It is possible for the shares and investment trust to trade at a discount to the net asset value or at a premium to the net asset value, right? So that's a very important part of investment trust investing is to understand how that works. Is that fair? 
Yeah, it's fair because as, when you go into the stock market, um, the price you pay is, is not decided by the value of the underlying portfolio, although it obviously influences the, the price, where the balance of buyers and sellers comes. And when you get periods of oversupply and lack of interest, the, the share price that you can pay can be a substantial discount to the value of the underlying portfolio. And we'll touch on it later, I'm sure, but that's the, the nub of what we're looking for. We're looking for things that are just f- effectively trading at the wrong price, That, but just because nobody cares about them at the moment. Yeah. And this is where we come back to what we were talking about earlier, whereas in, in the main, an investment trust has a sort of permanent portfolio in that the, the uh, cash under management doesn't change all the time with people coming in and out. But if there's a very big discount, the directors may decide to buy back shares, which of course shrinks the, the size of the trust. Or if it's trading at a premium, they may decide to issue more shares, which enhances the size of the trust. So it's not necessarily always a, a portfolio that isn't changing, but it's at the discretion of the directors. But the, the, and the interesting point on, on buybacks is unlike with a, an open-ended fund where you just get an email at half past 11 saying, please give me X million by, by 12 o'clock. If we find on the investment trust there's an oversupply that, that if not dealt with, it's going to lead to a, to a discount, then the, then the actual trigger is in our hands. And therefore, we can make certain that we've got the money in the portfolio to do a buyback before we actually push the button. And where, So we have control, where in the OIC, it's the unit holder that has control of the timing. Okay, so I think we've established what an investment trust is now. We've established how they work. Let's talk about where we are in the UK investment trust market at the moment. As you say, the UK investment trust market pretty much being the only investment trust market at the moment. It's not looking that great, is it? We've talked about how these wonderful attributes that investment trusts have, and we've said that over the very long term or the medium term, investment trusts have historically outperformed other types of collective vehicle in the UK. But right now, it's not looking good. No, the, the, the trust sector has suffered a near-death experience. That bad? You know, I wasn't I was expecting you to say it was that bad. <laughs> I think in October, it did feel that this perfect storm of events could be enough, particularly the cost disclosure. But we had a lot of things all happening at once, and it's still not bounced back. The average discount is around 17 or 18%, which is pretty well the widest ever, apart from briefly during the credit crunch. It's definitely our touching widest discount of all time in normal conditions. And what's caused all that? We've had an absolute perfect storm. And there was a new issue boom in sort of 2020, 2021 of high yielding trusts, because as you remember, deposit rates were effectively zero for a long period of time. And a number of trusts, particularly things like renewables or shipping or whatever, were structured with quite a high yield and a way of advisors getting their customers a, a, a decent return. Demand for those, and there was an enormous amount of issuance and, and supply. But recently, with gilts at one point getting up to 5.4%, why would you want to own an infrastructure fund yielding 6, say, when you could get, in theory, risk-free, a short-dated gilt yielding 5.4, which killed demand for a whole raft of investment trusts? And again, as I said before, if you've got limited demand and um, plenty of supply, share prices will just keep falling till the balance of buyers and sellers gets into equilibrium. So that was one of the factors. Two... Traditionally, the natural buyer of investment trusts were the old private client stockbrokers. And in the last decade or so, they've all been merged into these vast wealth management chains. And we've seen Vestec and uh, Rathbones being put together. That's going to be a £100 billion pot. And you're seeing quite a lot of standardisation of portfolios simply because of the size. The direction of travel is is standardisation. You've got a £100 billion pot there. If you say that you need 1% in in an investment to move the needle to make it worthwhile, the manager actually taking a position... You need a billion pounds worth of stock, and that will be difficult to achieve even in Scottish Mortgage, one of the largest investment trusts. That natural buyer will steadily disappear over the years, and that's an ongoing challenge now, particularly more for the larger trusts rather than the smaller ones, because the smaller ones have been off the buy list for some time. Just running down the list, we've had a a bizarre situation with the cost disclosure and the methodologies, which mean that you end up with vastly higher figures, theoretical figures for an investment trust than you do for an OIC. There was at one point as I said before, I run both, that the OIC version, same managers, same 65 basis point annual fee. But at one point, the open-ended fund had a, an OCF or the or cost disclosure of 89 basis points and the investment trust 309 basis points for this virtually the same portfolio. And that right the way across means that for a number of trusts that come up with very high figures and very strange results on the methodology become almost unbuyable for some investors who have to add those costs to their product costs and disclose it to their clients and very often don't get the opportunity to actually explain to their clients what's going on. Can I, Nick, can I stop you there? Sorry. And 
ask you to explain what that methodology is. What are we talking about here? How can the same portfolio be 89 basis points and 309 basis points, so under 1% and over 3% at the same time? Yeah, there are some reasons for that. You've got the, the cost of the board, you're a listed company on the stock market, and they are, to a certain extent, they are you know generally more expensive. You looked at, at our fund, the genuine figure might be 140. So still a lot higher than the OIC version. But you get all the benefits of being an investment trust and it's a, a better portfolio, et cetera. But probably the big change is that you now have to add all the costs of anything you invest in on top of your own costs. So that's almost like if you invested in Glaxo, reflecting all the costs of running Glaxo, but none of the income. And you get some, and because the investment trust sector specializes in some specialist asset classes, for example, secondhand life policies, for example, there the methodology means that you have to, the premiums, which are part of the investment function, get added to the costs. So it might work on a long only equity fund, but once you get into the world of the, the renewable energy or shipping lines or secondhand life policies, these or private equity is a, a, a big example. These costs are more akin to, to businesses, and it gives a very strange figure, which is misleading, to be honest, to the to to investors who are looking to use these funds. Just be absolutely clear, Nick. What what you mean is that let's say, for example, the fees on one investment trust would be one percent, and then the fees of investing in other things would be two or three percent, whatever it is, and you have to add them all together. Yeah. So you've got a, a, effectively yeah. a double yeah. fee. Whereas on an open ended fund, you don't have to do that. You don't, although you're investing in the same stuff. Yeah, but we are expecting this to be resolved, right? It's very much under conversation. Yeah, direction of travel has changed for the better. Yeah, there's the. I, th- I think that the Chancellor Exchequer, in the notes to his autumn statement, reflected or acknowledged the problem. It's just the bureaucracy to try and get this sorted. And you could have it carrying on like this for another year or so. And there is the risk. Certainly, when I was talking about the near-death experience, before this change of direction, it did feel like the regulators were going to accidentally kill the investment trust movement, something that survived two world wars, could just get accidentally shot. Because I don't think any regulator has set out to kill the investment trust sector. It's just, it comes back, the trust sector, because it's so different, and they said it's a purely British thing, that every time you try and standardise something, you just get very strange results. And the investment trusts don't cope very well with standardisation because they are different. Can I just take you back then to the second problem that you mentioned, which is the size issue with the wealth managers getting bigger and bigger and therefore not being able to invest in smaller trusts anymore because they can't get a large enough percent into their portfolio for it to make sense. What sort of size then makes a trust viable? Yeah, they used to say 100, then 200, then 400, but the figure keeps going higher as as these portfolios become ever larger. But if you think about it, even a billion pound trust I don't think it may be fine today, but the area that's most vulnerable is probably around the 500 to the billion pound mark, which until recently would have been large enough for the wealth managers to to use. But as they they merge and they get ever bigger, a billion pounds is relatively small. As I said, the Invesco Rathbets combination will be 100 billion. We're not there yet, but that's the direction of travel. They might need a, a billion pound ticket. Um, each time they invest in something. If you can't buy into a billion pound investment trust, you need to buy 100% of all the shares in issue. So I think that the, the problem is actually the medium and larger size trusts at the moment. The trusts like the one I run have been off their buy list for seven or eight years, and therefore it's less of an issue. So it's not small trusts that, that are struggling because the small trusts still exist. They found a reason for existing. They've they found an audience to play to. And I think probably size isn't simply, if you've got a £100 million investment trust owned by high net worth individuals, wealth managers are splintered away from the from the chains and retail investors, that can live quite healthily. But if you're a £250 million trust purely owned by the, the wealth management chains, you've got a problem. And so the £100 million trust in that example is healthy. The £250 million trust in that situation is doomed. So we've talked about the cost disclosures, the size, etc. You were about to offer me yet another problem, I think. What is it? <laughs> yeah, certainly when we were when we were touring the North fairly recently, a lot of people was, was, were making the point that they were, they were, a lot of the advisors are not coming anywhere near their benchmarks because you've got these six or seven of the magnificent seven, I think they call them, the, the, the big tech companies in the States, 
dominating the the gains in the in, in the stock market. And therefore, some of these investment trusts that have fallen to big discounts look particularly bad. And the knee-jerk reaction has been to to sell them, to get them off the, the register. So the whole event of the perfect storm has then triggered another type of seller. It's what we I used to call the killing the dog trade, in that back in the distant past, in the early 80s, I was a private client stockbroker. And if you had a, a dog in the portfolio and, say, 15 stocks and your client's coming in, you know that stock is still in the portfolio. 55 minutes of your one hour with the client is going to be talking about that stock. So you kill the dog before the meeting. It's a, it's a, a term from many years ago. And I think that's what we're seeing in trust as well, in that if you've got a, a trust you've paid a pound for and it's trading at 60p because it's trading at a big discount, you really want to, to sell. Yeah, absolutely. Get rid of it so you don't have to explain it, right? Exactly. That's exactly it. Brilliant. Or not brilliant. Depends how you look at it. The plus side here, right, assuming, have you got to the end of the litany of problems, Nick? Yep, that's enough. Yeah. Okay, good. That is the depressing bit of this conversation over. Because the next bit is about, I hope, and I hope you're not going to correct me on this, I hope the next bit is about these really are still great investment vehicles. All these problems exist. We've talked about how one of them may be resolved, but they exist. It's fair. I'm not going to deny that. But that might provide some absolutely fantastic opportunities for the value-orientated retail investor who would like to look at what they can buy at a whopping great discount to its net asset value. Yes, discounts are pretty well as wide as they've ever been. But whenever we've had discounts this wide, we've normally been in the middle of a financial crisis, which clearly is not happening at the moment. There are for all sorts of reasons the, the trust trade on wide discounts at the moment, as we've discussed. But Basically, the point is, if the market, for internal reasons, can't value assets properly, then the real world will come and take them. So we've got trust sitting on a 50 discount. Maybe the real world comes in and pays a 25 discount to to take the the decent assets and and leave. So, uh, yeah, the odds are stacked in your favour if you buy into the trust sector at the moment. Yeah, and possibly something of an opportunity for retail investors if professional investors can't buy particularly the smaller trusts in size. They're leaving them there for us. A lot of professional investors have been frightened off by the sector. They've, they've taken some losses on, on some things they didn't expect to, and they've lost their confidence, which is part of the reason why discounts are so wide at the moment. Now, one of the other things I noticed when I look at your portfolio is that there's pretty much no home bias there. Everyone often talks about how people have a natural home bias when it comes to investing. You absolutely do not, do you? I noticed, for example, there's even a, a trust investing in Georgia. Yes, we, we've probably got slightly more in Georgia than we have in the UK. Having said that, I think the institutional benchmarks, the UK is about four and we're about seven. Actually, you could say we, we've got nearly twice the uh, exposure to the UK than, than some of the benchmarks. But it's all focused on very small companies. And it, what's happened in, in microcaps is exactly what's happening in investment trusts for slightly different reasons. The institutional investors have become so large that they really need to be investing a few hundred million at a time. And therefore, if you invest in a company with a market value of 50 million or 100 million, even if it doubles or trebles, you just don't move the needle. So there's no point in them doing it. So these listed companies trade ever cheaper, but they're real companies in the real world generating real cash, real profits. And that's a great opportunity for retail investors. And 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 it's one that we're taking in the in the fund. Basically, it's like a Russian dollar discounts, the, the micro caps, because the UK trades at a big discount to the rest of the world. Small caps trade on a discount to, to, to large caps. Micro caps, even bigger discount. And every now and again, you can actually buy a, a perfectly good portfolio of, of, of microcaps in it within an investment trust trading on a 20% discount. So as I said, it's a sort of Russian doll type situation. Institutions aren't coming back to small. It's, there's a, a structural problem. But the real world, the individual companies will get taken out or uh, find a, a new way of ownership at a reasonable premium to where they're languishing in the stock market at the moment. Nick, let's just move around the world a little bit. You've got, you're holding two, or I think you're holding two investment trusts with investments in India, right? We're optimistic on India in the longer term. It's not massive position. We've certainly seen small and medium-sized companies perform extremely well. India is another very big beneficiary of the change in the world order. There, we, we, equities are quite expensive at the moment, but we, we, sometimes you can be too clever and just say they're too expensive this week and then sell and they drift down 10%. Then they then they find level and start going up again, and you never get around to, to jumping back on board. So, more of a, a long term macro view there. There's not really that much speculation in uh, India capital growth, although there is a little bit in J.P. Morgan India because it has investment windows every five years, and if it's underperformed over that period of time, then they have to give 25% of the money back at NAV. 
and it has at times traded on a 20 discount in the not too recent past. There was a change of manager a year or two ago, and it's a stronger trust than it's been in the past. But when they took over, they were a long way away behind in the current performance window, although they've made up quite a bit of ground. But if they don't make up all the ground, then they've got to give 25% of the money back at par. And yeah, that's obviously where we bought in at sort of around 80 pence in the pound. Getting a 20% movement on that part of the portfolio is quite a big percentage for no movement in the underlying portfolio. There is an element, and that's more of a large cap exposure. What you find with investment trusts is that when there's a change of manager or, where, or a trust that's underperformed for, for a number of years, such as JP Morgan India, they carry on trading on the track record of the vehicle rather than who's running it now. And uh, it maybe takes a year or two to, to catch up with the current reality. So you do, you do get that arbitrage between perception and reality with things like JP Morgan India. Okay, but let's look at where some of the really big discounts are, which is in the uh, private equity sector, the the trusted hold private companies, Chrysalis, for example, or Bailey Gifford Trust. You have fairly big holdings in 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 those. Let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, our well, biggest is is Oakley. Uh, we also got MB Private Equity in the private equity area. And Shahali and the Bailey Gifford one. Mm. Yes, the area has been hit particularly hard by this cost disclosure because private equity is quite quite an ex- ex- expensive um, mandate. Now, if this issue with the cost disclosures and, and the methodologies gets resolved, private equity is going to be a big beneficiary because some of these trusts get up to declaring an OCF of, of 700 basis points. And it, that means that they're uninvestable to maybe models being run by IFAs and wealth ma- wealth managers. Because you've got to declare that figure on top of your own costs and it just looks, all your client sees is the 7% from the private equity fund plus the 1% perhaps that the wealth manager is charging. They think they're being charged 8% and therefore it's, it's impossible for a number of investors to actually own this sector. So Nick, you think that the biggest problem with the private equity trusts is not so much lousy investments or investments that are valued incorrectly, but a cost structure that makes them uninvestable for wealth managers. Yeah, that's that's the main problem. There, there were in the past that those those have also been problems in that people didn't trust the valuations. But we've gone through a couple of years. Big four accountants will have crawled all over those valuations and signed them off, and they will be paranoid at the moment. So I think that issue has has passed, and and also um, you have more visibility on where the winners and losers are couple of years on from the from the big sell-off in that area so that was those were concerns but i think you don't need to worry about those now the big concern is supply and demand in the market and let's say when these rules came in that 15 percent of some of these private equity trusts were owned by people who would have to declare or add their these underlying costs to their own product details they really need to get out and probably half of that's already been sold but it's that selling pressure that's triggering the very, very wide discounts of sort of 25, 30, maybe 40% in, in, in some areas. As again, a lot of this just boils down to why. Out of all the, the, you hold quite a few of them, out of the ones that you hold, which is your favourite? I think Oakley Capital is the is the favourite long term, just very good at what they do and have created some amazing businesses. And that's been, that's been a, a great one for us. Recent ones that have gone in tend to be the more early stage type unlisted. That so, Shahalian, Chrysalis, and Seraphim Space. Tell us a bit about Seraphim Space. That's popped up on this podcast before, and we've had a, a couple of podcasts where we've talked about nothing but space. What are the, what's the interesting holdings inside Seraphim? Did it did it uh, get a little pop from that landing on the moon recently, etc. No, it sounds quite outlandish at first, but when you actually start looking at some of the business models, they are becoming more mature. It's amazing how much, you know, how how much is 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 done in space and just you know, things like mapping, but and insurance claims, for example, you can check with everything's being photographed all the time, and uh, you can check out insurance claims by just looking at images from space. It's so it's much more mature than perhaps you think, and they're much closer to profitability. And it just got to a point where it was trading on about a 65 discount. I think we paid 33 pence for our holding, and they bounced quite sharply in there. So it was just really a case of when the market was really nervous in October, there was almost no price for these, that people were completely averse to risk and perceived this as risky, and, and therefore the, the shares spiked down to, to a very low level. And literally, I think, again, 60, 65 discounts. We used to think 20% discount was was pretty wide. The extremes of discounts we've seen 
over the last year or two is something I've not seen before. And I've been doing investment trusts since the since the late eighties. Sixty five years again, you you wouldn't even dream of. So when you think when you can see that the the portfolio is quite interesting as well, it, it does give you the special situation to to exploit. Yeah, certainly fun. There were a couple, two more that I wanted to ask you about, particularly because I find them rather interesting. The first is the ground rents fund, which is fascinating, isn't it? Because we've been through this whole cycle in the UK of discussing, quite rightly, the appallingness of our leasehold system and how bizarre it is that people get caught up in these huge service charges and difficulties of having a leasehold. And then, of course, there's ground rents, ground rents, which is is money people pay for nothing, is a to lease a piece of land that most people rather believe that they, they already owned and it turns out that they don't. And ground, ground rents on older leaseholds are very low, peppercorn stuff. But on newer leaseholds, we found that they can be very expensive. So as this conversation has become increasingly political and there's been conversation about possibly uh, abolishing the leasehold system altogether, which apparently Michael Gove now tells us is far too complicated, the ground rent, a share price of the ground rent, rent trust genuinely collapsed, didn't it? Yes, I think still the net asset value is in the 90s so the shares are trading up to around... 30 odd. I think we paid a bit more than where we are at the moment. I think most of the shares we bought for sort of 37, 38 pence. I think that ground rents has worked perfectly well for years and years, but going back five or 10 years, there were excesses, particularly introduction by the house builders of ground rents on houses, because that makes no sense whatsoever. The point of, of a ground rent is if you've got a, a block of flats, you, you don't want the person who owns the, the ground floor not looking after the foundations, for example. And therefore, it's it practical that there is a freeholder and you, and you and you lease from them. That's a practical reason. In a house, the, 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 there isn't that need, and therefore they, they should never have ground rents. And it was the excesses a few years back has then created a bit of a, a, a backlash. But if you wanted to, and I don't think ground rents as, uh, will exist in the future in the way, and there won't be a, a, an asset class of owning ground rents. But what's going to happen to the existing ones is is what we're looking at, and. If the effectively the they were abolished and the owner's asset was wiped out, I think it would all end up in the courts because the law lords have said it's people's human rights to actually retain what they've actually purchased. There, there will be a compromise somewhere down the road, which means ground rents w- won't be effectively confiscated. But you know, these things won't exist in the future. There won't be new ground rents or there'll be a new system for it. So basically it's a call that there will be a, a compromise you might get 50 or 60 pence a share for your ground rent shares, but it's going to grind on for a long period of time. There was, Gove was talking about it last night, and, and clearly um, the bits and pieces I saw just from the uh, from the news is he's backing off a long way from his previous position, which is which should, in theory, be very positive for ground rent's income trust, but I haven't had a look to see this morning. I don't think there's been any change in the share price, but then there probably wouldn't, even if there was dramatically good news, nobody would notice because nobody cares. And that comes cuts back to the op- a lot of the opportunities that we, we exploited, just overlooked and unloved rather than... So that's at a whopping great discount and will probably come good over time. Massive discount, but obviously bear in mind, yeah, the NAV, I think it's like in the low 90s, but there is a material uncertainty clause in there from Savills because nobody really knows what they're worth. You have to treat the NAV figure with extreme caution. But even if it was, even if it was halved, that would still be a, a reasonable gain from where the share price is today. Now, there is, been, there is a catalyst coming into the market in the form of a few activist investors, right, who are looking at some of the investment trusts on discounts and uh, attempting to push the directors and the management to do buybacks, to merge, this kind of thing. And the one we hear the most about is Saba, which is an American activist investor that has been quite active in the investment trust market recently. And that, that to a degree, is the beginning of a catalyst, right? Yes. Now, it, never, it comes back to the point I was making earlier that, you know, that if the stock market can't value these things properly, if they leave them trading at wide discounts because of an oversupply situation, because of, in, in at the moment, the cost disclosure problem, for example, it doesn't affect the quality of the underlying assets. So if all these trusts sit trading at 60, 70 pence in the pound, somebody like Saba or and be others coming behind them will, will come and take those assets. Because if you if an investment trust trades on a massive discount, in theory, there's nothing stopping you buying lots and lots of shares and forcing it in, into wind down, which is what Saba, that's their gameplay. And therefore, the, as you said, that's the next catalyst coming along. If these things stay where they are trading at the moment, then it will be M&A that, that narrows the discount. Yeah. As John and I keep saying over and over again about cheap things, if you don't buy them, somebody else will. And then you'll be sorry. Nick, are there any investment trusts 
in your portfolio that we haven't talked about that you feel are an absolute must mention? Oh, let's have a look. I uh, one fi- a couple of final ones. One one sort of in two or three. I think we the one recent ac- acquisition is Ship, which is effectively a shipping line. Ship is the ticker. Its actual name is Tufton Oceanic, but we think that's a, a, a an interesting one in that they've put a date on the fund that they will start winding down after. 2018, oh, sorry, not 2018, 2028. So you know that there's a trust there trading on a big discount where the discount will narrow and you will get an exit if you stick around for, for three or four years. At a time where, you know, environmental pressures means that regulations dictate that ships or, or commercial shipping has to travel much slower to to, to be more green, um, which effectively is removing capacity, which will, which will help pricing. The other thing that's removing capacity is that there's been a boom in building container ships and Tufton doesn't own it, that that sector, but that's blocked out all the boat yards and the construction uh, yards for for many years hence. Again, it's coming back to the point that you've, you've got increasing demand and you've got shrinking supply, and therefore shipping rates are likely to increase, and therefore buying into a shipping trust on a big discount seemed a rather attractive route. One that slightly amusing one was Ecofin US Renewables, which had it, it, a solar farm wiped out in South Texas at a place called Whirlwind. And maybe maybe I sh- we should have been asking questions about why the name of Whirlwind, but then that asset was wiped out by a tornado. And the share price absolutely tanked, but of course it was all covered by insurance, and therefore that, that was an op- opportunity. And also we have exposure to UK small caps, and we don't think institutions will ever come back to buying UK small caps, but the ratings are just so low that the that the UK trades at a much at a big discount to the world, mid and small caps trade at a trade at a big discount to to, to large caps and micro caps trade at a bigger discount. All it's almost like a sort of dis, a Russian doll of discounts. When you then say you can actually buy these assets within an investment trust at a twenty percent discount to these bond out levels. So as I said, and again, that's very similar to what's happening to the trust world. That these things are are very low rated because the the institutions can't buy them because. The institutions, institutional portfolios are now so large that even, even bought all of a £100 million company just wouldn't move the needle. So they're not coming back, but these are companies chucking out decent profits in, in, in the real world, and somebody will come and take them. And if you can buy into that world on a 20 discount, then over time, that's, that value is going to be extracted. And which trust is it you hold to reflect that? Is that River and Mercantile? We've got River Mercantile Microcap is the largest, but we've also got rights and issues. We've got downing for a little bit longer because that's being wound down. So it's more of a, a package, really, but River Mercantile Microcap is the largest one. Okay, brilliant. Nick, thank you so much. I think I've taken up enough of your time and that was really interesting and lots of fascinating trusts as well. But before you go, I have to ask you the final question that I always ask everybody on this podcast and you do have to answer it whether you want to or not. Although I was told by a listener the other day that it's getting boring and I need to add something else to the question, but I'm not going to do that today. If I asked you to choose between gold and Bitcoin over a 10-year period, which would you choose? I think I understand gold. I'm not sure I'm of a generation that understands Bitcoin. And I'm just concerned that one day we find out it's worthless, which isn't going to happen on gold. But that's probably an answer typical of my generation. I'm afraid it is. I'm afraid it is. It's it's the normal answer that we get on this pod. Although we have had a couple of surprises along the way, a couple of surprises along the way. And I always come down on the side of gold and I, we have a lot of listeners and a lot of readers who are constantly explaining to me why I'm wrong. So one day maybe I'll understand why I'm wrong and why you're wrong as well. But we'll wait for that yeah. to happen. Nick, thank well, you so much for wait. joining us today. I've been, I've been wrong on we plenty of things over the years. So one more won't hurt. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Brilliant. Thanks so much. John, I thought that was pretty interesting. I tell you what, Nick really knows what he's talking about when it comes to investment trusts. He's always my favorite investment trust guest. What did you learn from this? I mean, Nick's fascinating. Um, and I think that he really does get into the the weeds on the structural benefits, but also the huge structural problems that kind of investment trusts face right now. Um, and I just think it's interesting because, again, I sort of see this weird echo of the UK market as a whole, where you've got perfectly decent kind of companies that are being essentially undervalued because there are flaws in the regulatory regime um, and also because of consolidation within the wealth management area means that a lot of these trusts and a lot of these companies are just not big enough 
for any of these kind of big managers to want to put their money in because they won't make a difference to their portfolios overall. Um, so I actually thought... Mm. <laughs> and also there's liquidity. They can't get yeah. in and out when they're too small, you know? I know. I mean, well, yeah, because that's the other thing. Even whenever I've been writing about investment trusts, you know, on an on and off basis for years, obviously. And one of the things that you notice, particularly now, is whenever, if I'm writing about them for Bloomberg, is you start to say, oh, wait a minute, if, you know... <laughs> The bid offer spread on that one, as in the gap between the price at which you can buy today and then immediately sell, is so big that you can't realistically tell a private investor that that's a good idea because they have to make ten percent before they've even, you know, got back to zero. Um, so I do think. I mean, I thought this was like really interesting, and also it's really good to have someone out there who is basically an investment trust arbitrator that normal people can get access to. You know, he's because a lot of this is just activism that he's talking about. I mean the JP Morgan India Trust is a good one. You know, he's he's kinda he's done he's done the details, read the paperwork and has kind of said, well actually wait a minute, if if this trust, you know, has to follow its rules, then it means that I'm going to be up because, you know, this amount of it is going to be redeemed at par. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of, I just, I, I really like uh, the, the kind of way he thinks about trust. One of the things that I've always found attractive, but there's so many things I find attractive about investment trust, and Nick and I talk about those, but one of the things that, that we've always known is that over the uh, medium and longer term investment trusts have tended to outperform uh, open ended funds, particularly you often have an open ended fund and a closed ended fund, closed end being another way of saying investment trust, um, run by the same investment house, by the same fund management group. And historically, you've found that the investment trust outperforms the other. Now, what we don't know is if that's going to keep happening going forward, because one of the reasons for it historically has been that investment trusts have been cheaper than open-ended funds, and they're kind of not anymore because the cost of open-ended funds has come down so much. Partially thanks, by the way, to you and me, John, all the years we've spent agitating for reduced fees. We have managed to get a lot of these fund management houses to push down their management fees, and that has had the effect of making investment trusts not quite as cheap as they used to be. So now we get to find out, we get to find out whether the other great things about investment trusts, having boards that are beholden absolutely to the shareholders, having the ability to use some leverage, et cetera, whether these things are enough to keep the outperformance going over the over the longer term. I personally believe that, that they are because I think that the in particular, the idea of having a pool of permanent capital is very attractive to a manager and should make a difference to the way they, they operate. But it's not a given. So it's an interesting time. The only other thing to say about that, of course, is that the discount Discounts at the moment are phenomenally high relative to history, although they've closed a bit over the last six months. And whenever discounts are at this kind of level, you tend to see very good performance afterwards. The AIC, and we might put a link to the AIC in the show notes because they've done some, some excellent work on this and everything you need to know about investment trusts of any kind is on the AIC website. Or are there any of the trusts that we talked about in particular, John, that you thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and buy that one, not financial advice, obviously? The ones I'm more interested in at the moment still are the private equity ones. Um, yeah, I, well, I just think his point about they have been particularly badly hit by the fee disclosure screw up, basically. Um, and then on top of that, you've got the concerns about what the underlying valuations are. But if you look at, I mean, like Rec Capital came out um, the other day, and their private assets had kind of nudged a bit higher. And when you look at stock markets, stock markets have all gone higher. It's hard to believe that the underlying value of these businesses, assuming that they generate cash flows, which a lot of them do, are not basically what they see on the NAV. Um, and even if they're a bit below that, there's still a massive discount. So I do, I, I'm still reluctant <laughs> i don't know why i'm reluctant but i sort of feel as if there's i'm not high conviction about it but i think private equity is probably the most interesting area at the moment still rit capital that has been so disappointing that has been one of the most disappointing trusts i think you know i remember thinking even 15 years ago that this was a a great solid long-term trust mm -hmm. to hold um, and it kind of hasn't been 
Oh, no, so if that private equity stuff came good, yeah. that would be great. That would be great for lots of our listeners, I'm sure. Anyway, I commend this podcast to you because it really is very good. And, and have a look at Nick's fund. Have a look at the, the trust that he talks about and have a look at the AIC website. Um, the investment trust market is really interesting. If you're interested in any of these niche areas in the market, there are very many ways to get access to them. And the investment trust sector is probably the place to look. Thanks for listening to this week's Marion Talks Money. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, if you like our show, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And of course, do tell your friends. This episode was hosted by me, Marion Somerset Webb. It was produced by Samasadi and Cam Gray. Additional editing by Rushi B. J. Cole. And special thanks to Nick Greenwood and to John Stafford.